Are dogmen owned by gnomes? Do your scary stories NYC? I have an ongoing situation for you here in Tennessee, where my family have been experiencing trouble from a clan or community of gnomes who don't seem to want us to live here. There are also dogmen here, and in fact, I'll start the narrative off with a dogman encounter that we had while we were still moving our stuff from Nashville all the way out here to Williamsburg, Tennessee, which is a very beautiful part of the country, to be certain. It's about a 40-minute drive between Nashville and Williamsburg. And in fact, my wife and I both still work part-time in Nashville to this day. We decided it would be less stressful for us to make multiple trips from home in our pickup truck to move ourselves, rather than hire movers and rent a big truck. Each weekend, we'd pack up more stuff to move out to the new place, until we were finally out there. One night, after unpacking a ton of our belongings, we all had to head back to Nashville in the dark, since we weren't set up to sleep and eat at the new place yet. It was me driving, with my wife Blanche and our two young kids squeezed into that cab, with the daughter on Blanche's lap. We were driving near the airport road exit for Route 299, when all of a sudden, from somewhere I couldn't see to my left, this big dog-headed monster man came running out onto the road in front of me. It was like a hairy man, but the largest hairy man you can imagine. It wasn't Bigfoot, though, because Bigfoot has a face more like a human, or at least like an ape, I guess. This thing had a dog's head or a wolf's head. There was no doubt about it. He ran on two legs, though, straight in front of our truck, and then he dove over the railing on the right and seemed to somersault down whatever hill is over there out of our view. Both the kids were excited, screaming for me to stop the car and go back. They actually wanted to be let out to chase the dog man through the woods. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, and I blamed their mother for this insanity. She's got their heads so full of fairy tales, they aren't even afraid of anything that can kill and eat them. She's got my kids thoroughly denatured and living in children's fantasy books. That's why, when my daughter started talking to me one day about the mean and nasty little men who lived under the ground in our backyard, I just rolled my eyes and ignored her. One night at dinner, my son let out a foul word that would have gotten me a smack and a spanking. I was pretty shocked, and I asked him where he heard such a dirty word. He told me that that was what the little man with the beard called me behind my back. Ticked off, I demanded he fully explain what the heck he was talking about. And then both my kids finished each other's sentences, telling me about the men who lived in underground tunnels under our backyard. They had long beards. They wore little pointy hats. And they constantly threatened to slice my throat in my sleep, or to abduct our kids and hold them underground in exchange for a thousand pieces of gold as a ransom. This was the last straw. I put my foot down. No more fantasy fairy tales for my kids. I took all the children's books in the house and donated them to a library. Then I replaced them with Encyclopedia Britannica. If my kids were going to read, then they were going to read facts. Not harmful fairy tales to damage their impressionable minds. And then, when I got back from giving away all my children's books, I came home and put my feet up in my recliner so I could finally get some rest. But when I looked out the window to my left, I saw the ugliest face I ever saw in my life. Then I screamed bloody murder. I pulled a muscle in my lower back, jumping out of that chair to run to the window where that hideous, monstrous, little wrinkly bearded man's face was just barely peeking over the bottom of the window. Seeing me coming, that face broke out into an even uglier smile and then dropped down out of sight. When I got to the window, I looked out to see a tiny, and I mean truly tiny little man, not even two feet tall, and it was wearing green rags that seemed to have been sewn together by hand. He picked up a long conical thing made of cloth and pulled it up onto the top of his head as he ran away from me, pulling up plants and young trees with glee and abandon as he ran off. I was about to open the window and yell at him when he leaped up into the air, and seemed to drop down into an invisible hole that I couldn't see. He completely disappeared into the ground, and I still couldn't see that hole that he had dropped down into. Stunned, I walked to my wife's home office to tell her what I'd seen. 
She took one look at my shocked, pale face, and she said, You've finally seen one of the gnomes, haven't you? Where we live in Williamsburg, Tennessee, we are situated between the Daniel Boone National Forest up in Kentucky and the Nantahala and the Chattahoochee Oconee National Forests south of that in Kentucky and Georgia. It's all hills and valleys around here, and it's truly God's country. I moved us here as soon as I could afford to, as I didn't want my wife and kids living in the city anymore. I thought that living out here would make everything better for us, and we'd have the perfect life, living the American dream. Instead, we wandered into a sort of bizarre American nightmare. Actually, it's not even American, is it? Where are gnomes supposed to be from? They dress like they're going to a freaking renaissance fair, so they don't look American. They look like they stepped out of a movie about Maid Marian or something. They seem completely out of place in modern America. I went on the internet on a fact-finding mission. I didn't know if I would find the answer to our problem, but I knew it wouldn't hurt to educate myself about what was happening. And what was happening to us was gnomes. So I discovered that in mythology and lore, gnomes are small elemental creatures usually associated with the earth element. They're often depicted as small bearded men wearing pointy hats, living in forests, hillsides, or underground. They are believed to be masters of both magic and mining, with an affinity for precious metals and stones. They have a reputation for being mischievous, but can also be helpful to humans who show them respect. Some cultures also associate gnomes with healing and medicinal properties, and they are often depicted as guardians of natural spaces. That all kind of fit in with what we'd been experiencing, minus the helpful to humans part. Reports of modern gnome sightings are typically from individual eyewitness claims. These sightings occur all around the world, but the majority of reports originate from rural areas in North and South America, Europe, and Asia. Generally, modern gnome sightings report very similar characteristics. Small human-like creatures with beards, wrinkled faces, and pointed hats, resembling the traditional depiction of garden gnomes. They are typically described as standing between one and two feet tall and having an almost supernatural ability to disappear into the woods or into cracks in the earth. Some people have also reported hearing little voices or rustling noises, leading them to believe that gnomes are nearby. I was truly surprised to learn that this is a whole thing. Gnomes are seen quite often, believe it or not. Here are just some alleged gnome sightings that originated from within the United States. In 1976, a family in rural Minnesota reported seeing several small humanoid creatures with pointy hats and long beards outside their home. The gnomes reportedly vanished at a nearby pond. In 1981, a woman in Florida claimed she encountered a small gnome-like creature while walking her dog at night. She said it was wearing a pointed hat the gnome, not her dog, and that it had reddish-orange hair. In 2019, a man in Pennsylvania reported seeing a gnome-like creature near a creek in the woods. He described it as having a wrinkled face and a long white beard, and he said it disappeared into the brush. In 2020, a resident of a small town in New Jersey reported seeing a gnome-like creature in their backyard. They said it was around two feet tall had pointy ears, and was wearing a green suit. In 2021, a group of friends camping in the woods in California reported seeing small gnome-like creatures with long beards and green hats playing by a stream. The creatures reportedly disappeared as soon as the campers tried to get closer. So then I looked into whether there have been sightings or encounters with these nasty little men anywhere near where we live. Guess what? Yes. There have been alleged gnome sightings reported in or near Kentucky and Tennessee. Here are a few examples. In 2013, a woman claimed to have seen a gnome-like creature while walking her dog in a park in Nashville, Tennessee. She said it was about two feet tall and had a white beard and a red hat. In 2014, people in the town of Elizabethtown, Kentucky reported seeing small gnome-like creatures in a local park. Witnesses described them as about two feet tall, with beards and pointed hats. In 2015, a man in the small town of Manchester, Tennessee, reported seeing a gnome-like creature in his backyard. 
He said it was about 18 inches tall and had a green hat and a long beard. In 2019, a family in the rural area near Bowling Green, Kentucky, claimed to have seen several gnome-like creatures outside their home. They said the creatures were about two feet tall and had green hats and brown clothing. This was all getting a little too real for me. I felt like I was a character in an old made-for-TV monster flick. The more I researched the creature bothering my family, the more real it seemed to be. I eventually needed a night off, so I went to a bar I like to hide out in. I'm not going to tell you where, because I go there to get away from everyone I know who knows me. That night I went there to talk to strangers about gnomes, and to see if anyone else in that region might know more than I did about what exactly was going on. That night I told my story to everybody at the bar, which was about five people total, including the bartender. Two of the guys just thought I was kidding, and they wandered off to sit at a table and talk about less crazy stuff. The other two patrons took me seriously, though. One of them told me a friend of a friend's story about a gnome that ended up destroying a family septic tank and causing quite an expensive and smelly mess. He told me I had better figure out how to appease them and abandon all thoughts of scaring them off or getting them to relocate. The other guy told me that where we were, Williamsburg, was in the south central part of a big 500 mile stretch with the famous Kelly Hopkinsville gnome attack on a farmhouse on the extreme western end, and the spot where the cave gnomes were allegedly seen in the Hellier documentary series on the far eastern end. Williamsburg is right between those two places and a bit to the south. That is an area, that 500 mile expanse, which you can drive in around eight hours most of the time, with a whole lot of underground caverns underneath. Lots of them are natural, but some say there are many more that were created artificially. This guy in the bar didn't think they were all made by mankind, however. And he implied that these gnomes understand mining and digging on a level far above what humans can grasp. What they do looks to us like magic, but they just have a kind of science that is in some ways so far in advance of ours that it would look like magic to us. Especially when you see them wearing tattered clothing sewn together with stolen yarn of a mismatched color, you don't immediately think, there goes a creature far more intelligent than I. But they are, this stranger insisted to me. Or at least, their intelligence is different to ours. It's a parallel kind of intelligence and worldview. And if you don't believe me now, the drunk in the bar warned me, you will eventually... The stuff he said about Hellier and Kelly Hopkinsville intrigued me, so I looked into both of them to see if they had a bearing on what my family was enduring. According to reports from the Hellier documentary series, the gnome-like creatures seen in the area were described as roughly two to three feet tall humanoid beings with large heads and eyes, wearing hooded robes or cloaks. They were observed moving quickly and silently, sometimes disappearing in plain sight. Compared with other alleged gnomes or fairy-like creatures in folklore and paranormal research, the Hellier gnomes share some similarities in appearance and behavior, such as being small, elusive, and potentially otherworldly. However, their specific characteristics and origins are still subject to interpretation and debate. The creatures allegedly cited attacking a farmhouse in Hopkinsville, Kentucky in 1955 were described as being about three feet tall having long arms and short legs, large ears, and glowing eyes. Witnesses claim that these creatures seemed to hover above the ground, move quickly, and their skin was noted as being reptilian in nature. There was also an account that they had round heads like a basketball without a neck. They were reportedly able to withstand gunfire, but eventually retreated. In comparison, the creatures seen in Hellier were described as being similar in size and movement to those Hopkinsville creatures. However, there were some differences. The Hellier gnomes had large, oversized heads, and their bodies were more humanoid, with arms and legs like a person, whereas the Hopkinsville creatures were described as having elongated arms. There was no mention of glowing eyes or amphibious or reptilian texture in the Hellier creatures' sightings. Overall, both sets of creatures share some similarities in size and behavior, but their specific physical characteristics and behavior are quite different. 
And in my opinion, neither of them are the same thing as what was on, or rather under, our property. For instance, I didn't hear about the Hopkinsville goblins uttering curse words when the family shot at them. While I was getting lost in my research, the family was continuing to suffer under the harassment of the little men. It really made me feel sad as my wife began to insist that we needed to move for the safety of our children. I was beginning to agree with her, and it weighed on me very heavily. One night I woke up at 2 or 3 a.m., and on an impulse, I went out into the yard behind our house, intending to try to communicate with the gnomes and strike a deal with them. From somewhere in the darkness, I got hit with a little mud pie. I didn't have to guess who threw that, and so I began speaking to the small men, assuming they could hear me. I told them that I wanted to appeal to them to call a truce. Then, I got hit with more mud, right in my crotch. This was followed by raucous laughter from the surprisingly deep-voiced little gnomes. Finally, they emerged from the bushes and began pretending to want to negotiate with me. Each time I would begin to speak, however, they would interrupt with an obscene suggestion, and then they would all collapse in laughter at my expense again. I began to feel genuinely frightened of them, as more and more came out of the darkness to join in on insulting me and talking about what they'd like to do with my wife. We all heard branches and leaves crackling in the night, and those little men and I gasped in unison as we turned to see a truly huge monster walk out of those woods on two legs. It was ten feet or taller, with shoulders wider than an NFL linebacker's. When it came out into the light, I could see that it was a dogman, just like the kind that I had seen running across the road that night when we were still moving in. I was so afraid of these gnomes that the appearance of the dogman actually brought with it a sense of relief as I hoped the beast man would scatter the heinous little trolls. The dogman walked toward us all, and we each, without exclusion, took a step back to allow the hairy giant his space. And then, with no warning whatsoever, the dog-headed creature dropped forward to all fours, standing as a normal dog might. Scrambling up the huge canine's legs and tail, the ugly little freaks climbed up on top of him like they were climbing into a four-legged school bus. Once situated in place on top, the gnome who had been speaking for the others gave me a sideways look and told me to have my wife respond to their list of demands quickly if I truly wanted peace with his good people. And then... That dogman ran off, completely under control of the gnomes. When they were gone from my sight, I knew for certain that I could never defeat those gnomes. They could control the mind of an apex predator, and that meant that they could have me down on all fours giving them rides next, if they wanted to. I was either going to have to do things their way, or we were going to have to move. When I got back, there was a list on the kitchen table, written in a language I could not understand and had never seen anything like before. I labored over trying to make sense of it until my wife came down for breakfast. She glanced at the note and laughed at me. For her, the note was written out very clearly and precisely in capital letters. I, on the other hand, saw a sloppy script. For her, it was in English and it listed things that she must do for the little men on the left with punishments for failing to obey on the right. All of the punishments were directed at me or my two children, yet all the responsibilities were placed on the shoulders of my wife. She needed to bake them two pies a day with specific ingredients that changed for each day of the week. And she also had to mend their garments. I forget the rest of the demands, but for some reason Blanche had no problem with any of them, and she decided that we should stay. I worry about her getting sick and missing a deadline. Then something terrible might happen to me or the kids. When I talk to Blanche about it, though, she dismisses my worries, saying that none of us will ever get sick again as long as we stay on the good side of the good people. You see, unlike the dogman, who has no choice but to obey the gnomes, they would rather not have to actually hypnotize and control us humans. 
They would rather we do it voluntarily. Sometimes it makes me feel like my family are the property of those foul-talking villains. Which brings me all the way back to my original question. Are dogmen owned by gnomes? Please say yes to CS. We invite you to join us thanking CS for making this and so many of our other episodes possible. We literally can't thank her enough, which is why we make her a supervising producer of our shows now. CS is a channel member and gets to see all our secret uncensored episodes, but she also donates to us more than anyone else in the world. She's kept us going through dark times and bright, and we would not still be doing this in April 2023 if it weren't for this woman. So if you like the show, then please thank CS, because she is just as responsible for it remaining online as me or anyone else. Thanks, CS. And if you would like to be one of those special people who helps guide us out of the darkness and back to the light, then just listen to what this next young feller has to say. Hank? Thanks, Biggie. And thanks to all of you for watching this far. If you liked it, please click like. If you'd like to see more of our work, please subscribe. And also click that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we put out a new episode. To become an executive producer, you can donate to us through the thanks button under each of our videos or through our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page. To receive cool perks like secret uncensored Dogman episodes far too wild to ever run on this channel, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button. Or join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com. Joining either at the $3 a month level or above gets you access to our over 25 hours of secret uncensored Dogman stories available nowhere else. Do you have a scary story about Dogman or some other kind of high strangeness that happened to you? Let us know by emailing us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or by leaving us a voicemail message at 804 LaScary. You may need to call back on that when it cuts off after, I think, three minutes. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, thank you for simply watching to the end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Come back, come back for more scary, scary stories. stories.